This month, we uh, started a new series last week called Love What Matters. Love What Matters. We talked about last week about uh, how much God loves us. How much did he love us? He loved us so much that he gave us his only son, the best. He gave us his best. He gave us his, his best. We talked about the different kinds of love. Phileo love, which is the friendship love. We talked about the eros love, which is the, uh, the physical type of love. We talked about the agape, God kind of love, the unconditional love, the love that he loves us with. He loves us with a, a, a love we can't even imagine how deep his love is for us. And we're to reflect him, aren't we? We're supposed to love others with agape love, with unconditional love. How many know that sometimes it's just hard to love other people? Isn't it? It's hard. A person that sort of uh, is not nice to you, that boss that doesn't uh, treat you very, very well, right? A person in school that just sort of uh, puts you down or whatever talks about you. It's not, it's hard to love those kind of people. But God says we need to love. We need to love them anyway. So we talked about that because God loves us, so he wants us and expects us to love others. So we need to love what's mattered, love what's matter, what matters. And today we're going to talk about... Uh, that God matters to me, or that, about our love for God. How should we love God? How are we supposed to love God? How do we show God we love Him? So we're just going to get right into the, to that today and talk a little bit about what is love. Let's watch a short video. So we do love what matters to us, you know. Uh, we love my kids, right? We love our kids. They bring us joy. They bring us happiness. Uh, me love my wife. I love my wife. She brings me happiness. She's my best friend, right? I me love, me love ketchup. I love Heinz ketchup. All right? It's got to be warm. It can't be cold. It's got to be cold. It's got to be warm. Warm Heinz ketchup. And I love Henry's dressing. That's awesome dressing. So we love things that matter, don't we? Things that bring us joy. We, we, we really seem to love those things. So what do we do if we love something? We invest in them, right? We invest in our families because we love them. We invest in Henry's dressing because I love it. I buy a couple bottles when it's on sale. I mean, right? You invest in those things. So from God's point of view, though, he wants us to really invest our love in him. Amen. Putting him first does wonderful things to our heart where we begin, can become, begin to start loving people like he loves people. Some people look for joy and happiness and all that and other things, you know, and people are looking out there for some kind of void to fill, that void to fill, that lack of happiness, whether it's drugs, alcohol, sex, whatever it may be, they're looking for fulfillment and they're not going to find that. And God says, hey, look to me. I'll fulfill you. As you place your love and your affection and invest in me, I will bless you. I will give you what you need. In uh, Psalm 1611, the psalmist says, you fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. And Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. We place our affection and our investment, we invest our time and effort and our love into God. He blesses us. He loves us. He wants to bless us. He wants to fulfill us. And our text today is uh, in, in Mark chapter 12. Jesus is uh, talking to the, the Sadducees. There's the Pharisees, there's the Sadducees, and the Pharisees and Sadducees were always at each other because they didn't believe the same thing. Uh, sometimes churches get into that thing too where they have, you know, uh, buttheads on, on doctrinal type issues, you know, and a lot of, I think, I think Christian churches have a, a tendency sometimes to really major on minor sometimes, you know. And it, it even happened back in then as far as the Sadducees and Pharisees. Uh, the Sadducees uh, believed in, they believe there's no resurrection Direction, okay, and the Pharisees did, and that was a big deal to the Pharisees. You don't believe that? Where you guys are going to go to hell because you guys don't, you know? So it was like they were at them, you know, they're at each other. So Jesus is teaching these people, and they're they're sort of impressed with what Jesus had to say. They said, "This guy sounds like he knows what he's doing, what he's saying." So one of the Sadducees, one of the religious laws or teachers, comes up to him and says in verse 28 of Mark 12, he says, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. So Jesus is debating back and forth and all that too. And he realized that Jesus had answered well. This guy knows what he's talking about. So he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? Hmm. 
Let's get him on this one. Well, Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. He says, listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord. And you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. That's the, all the commandments distilled into the first most important commandment. Right? We have a tendency to make things very complicated. But Jesus distilled it down to one commandment. And that is to love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of it. All of our being. He wants us to, to love Him. That is His answer. Okay? It isn't just, just believe in God. Just believe in God. It's not, we'll just have faith in and obey God. It's to love God. The commandment is to love Him, to place our affection on Him and invest in Him. It's the greatest commandment. And how many know when you have like a, a, a lot of commandments, things can get really confusing? Remember my daughter Elise, uh, when she was younger and it was our first child and she was about, you know, four or five and we'd go in there, okay, go in there and at least clean your room, okay, pick up and make your bed and then would you put your, you know, clothes over here, you know, put your dirty clothes in the thing, you know, and we'd give her all these little commandments and then leave her to herself. We'd come back and nothing was really done. She was just sort of having a good time playing, you know. But I think when I look back, her being Miss ADD, we gave her so many things to do that she just said, I don't know what to do. Ever feel that way? I used to have a boss like that too. You know, I mean, he was just, man, he was just hitting everybody hard. I was working in a supermarket and he'd come up to me and give me four or five things to do. And by the time he got done and left, it was like, now what do you say? I know I'm supposed to do this. You know, it can be very, very confusing sometimes when we get too many of them. But Jesus was good uh, to help us a little bit, to help us to, okay, this is what's important. Forget about all these other ones. This is the most important. Now, if you go back to, to, to these times where Jesus is talking to the Sadducees and the Pharisees and all that, too, they not only had like the Ten Commandments, they had 613 different commandments in the Torah. 613 commandments. Can you imagine 613? Trying to remember, I mean, you know. So that's why they said that, you know, what's the most important one? So they had 631. 365 were negative commandments. Of those 613, 365 were negative commandments. Don't do this, don't do that. All right? And, the, and, and they represented, again, one day. So they had one negative comment for every day. Isn't that depressing? That's like every. So, so they not only, had, not only had 365 negative commandments, but then they had, this is, this is a good news here, they had 248 positive commandments. Okay, even though it didn't exceed the negative commandments, it, it, it was you know, pretty close. But they ascribed, where did they get, where'd they get 248? Well, 248 was ascribed to the number of bones and main organs in the body. I don't know how you count all that, but, but all the positive were ascribed to the organs, okay, in, in bones in the body. So they must have counted all those things and said, okay, we're going to make a positive command for each and every one of them. Okay? So, can you understand the confusion? Which is the most important, Jesus? You seem to know what you're talking about. What is the most important? What do I do? I got 613 I'm looking at. <laughs> I'm confused, but Jesus distilled it down, down to one to love him with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And he was, he was quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. So he's looking back to the Old Testament and saying, hey, this is, let me just still forget about all this man-made commandments here. And let me just give you the one most important. So that's got to be liberating, right? We don't have to follow commandments and, and, and always be like, on edge. we just, man, we just got to do the, we got to love God with everything we've got. If we can do that, man, I'm telling you, we, we, we'll go very, very far if we can do that. But the first and great commandment of God's law is that we love him with every single part of us. Not only just in word and deed, but also with a sincere love, with everything that we have, okay? We, in our speech, okay? In everything, our actions should show forth love towards God. 
That's what he's looking for. He wants us to not walk blindly, but to get to know him, get to know what he's all about, get to really know him. You know, to, to know somebody, you've really got to spend some time with them, don't we? To get to know my wife, I've got to spend time with her. To get to know my kids better, I've got to spend time with them. I've got to spend time with people that I love and I care about and I want to get to know. You got to, I want to spend time with them just to get to know them so I can do my best to be a blessing to them and just to love them and show the love of Christ to them. So Jesus wasn't focused, this one, this one is focused on the performance of the law, right? Do this, do that, do this, right? Don't murder. Well, that's a good thing to not to do, right? That's a good thing not to do. Don't lie. Well, that's not so bad, you know, don't even lie, you know, sometimes, you know, I mean, you know, that type of thing. No, 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 no. These commandments can be like performance orientated. He's just saying, hey, just love me. This is simple, love me. And this is how you love me, okay? And he makes it a commandment as well. Why does he say, why does he command us to love him? Why does he command us to be like water baptized? Why does he make commands to us like that? It's because he loves us. He knows what's best for us. He says, you know what? I'm commanding you to love me because I have so much for you. And when you love me and you place your affection and your time on me, man, it opens up a world, a world of blessings, he's saying. I want to bless you. I want to bless you. So let's try to dig into this commandment a little bit more as far as, let's look at the heart, soul, mind, and strength. What is he saying here? As we get into the, to the Greek, we look these, I look these up. So what does it mean to love him with all our hearts? Okay? Basically, the heart is the effective center, affective center of our being. It affects everything that we say, everything we do, it affects it. Okay? It, and has the capacity of moral preference. Okay? It's a desire producer that makes us tick. It's our desire decisions that establish who we are. So in our heart, it establishes who we are. You know, out of, the, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You know, sometimes when we have, you know, something comes out of our mouth that we go, oh my gosh, where did that come from? It's coming from our heart. So what do we do? We need to back up a little bit and say, Lord, I don't know where that came from, man, but obviously it's in my heart because it came out of my mouth. God, please forgive me. It's a good monitoring tool. Because again, what's in our heart is going to come out. It's going to come out in actions. Why did I do that? I've got to look inside. I've got to look within. All right? So a short definition is this, the heart is the inner life or the intention. Okay? The actions. All right? It's the, the heart, character, inner self, the will, the intention of our being. So that's the heart. So we need to love him with all our heart. Everything. Everything. We need to love him. And then he says we need to love him with all our soul. Our soul is the person's distinct identity, the personality of a person. I mean, we all have different personalities. Wouldn't it be terrible if we all had the same personality? Wouldn't that be boring, especially in a marriage? I'm glad my wife is different from me. Sometimes I'm not, actually, when I think about that, you know. <laughs> Wish she was more like me, but she's not. But that's good for me because it helps me, you know, stay on track, I guess you could say. It helps her stay on track. We sort of like, we clash a little bit sometimes, and you will do that because we have different personalities. She grew up in a different household, different type of household than I did. She grew up in a Christian home. I did not grow up in a Christian home. She had a father that was not very involved in her life. I had a father that was not involved too much in her life. He was always, my father was always at the bar, unfortunately. Her father was always working, trying to supply, you know, supply and, and provide for the, ham, the family. So she grew up in that type of environment that dad wasn't there because he was out working. And I grew up in an environment where dad wasn't there because he was out drinking. You know, I had a great dad, obviously, come, you know, eventually came and accepted Christ. But his personality was he wanted to be accepted by everybody. And he went to the bar to be accepted by everybody and have drink. I mean, you know, that type of, so people, you know, have different personalities. And that's a good thing to be different. 
okay? But sometimes our personality can really get us in trouble as well. So we got to really be careful that we stay close to God and we love God. We get into his word, all right? So we don't fall off the, you know, the, of the track of, of moving and, and living our lives in the flesh and instead of in the spirit, okay? So that's our heart, that's our soul. And then it goes into our mind, our mind. The mind is our disposition, it's our thought. It's our understanding, our intellect. It's our mind, our, our insight. It, it says literally it's thorough reasoning. Incorporates both sides of a matter to reach a meaningful and a personal conclusion. So our minds sort of figure things out. How many here are real, uh, how would you say? Uh, uh, what's the word? Analyzers. I mean, you like to analyze everything. Anybody here analyzers? Okay. You know, analyzers are usually like engineers and, you know, they analyze things or they're like CPAs, you know, they got to analyze the numbers, you know, and all that's good. Uh, but they use their mind and critical thinking and all that too. And, you know, God wants us also to use our minds. You know, Christians aren't supposed to be mindless. They're not. We're supposed to think. We're not supposed to, you know, just... All right, I, you know, I, I, I believe it, so I'm just going to do it. Well, you know, we've got to get and use our minds and get into the Word of God and, and think through the Word of God, get it in our hearts, okay, because it goes, it goes into our minds. We think about it, right? Then it drops into our hearts and becomes our actions and our ways. So we've got to love Him with our mind. We've got to say, Lord, help me. Help me to reason things out the right way as far as according to your word because we can justify anything. I was talking to a girl yesterday uh, or a couple days ago, a friend of my, my, one of my daughters, and she's getting into uh, as far as she really needs healing, so she's into these different type of healing type things, you know. Uh, hard to explain it, but it's it is crystals and you know if you put use this I mean it gets a little little strange you know and I'm trying to you know I'm going back to the word of God and I don't recall any crystals in the Bible that you can be healed because you have a crystal on a certain part of I don't think it lines up in God's word but she's trying to figure all this out she's saying okay well I'm you know I, I need some help and I and, and, and I do I, I think I know what the Bible says but but I think I'm going to try to maybe try this I'm going to I'm going to try this this go into this this place and have some crystals put on me and and say these certain things and and believe I'm going to be healed. Sometimes our minds can rationalize that. And then we say, well, that does line up with God because they call this light. This particular stone is, is called like the light. And you put that over there and it sort of enlightens you. And I'm thinking, well, let's, let's go back to see what the Bible says. So I had to, you know, just walk her through the Bible a little bit too. And she just, well, I, I heard this preacher on, the, on, the, uh, on, a, on a podcast. He was, he was really good. So I, I pulled him up and I said, well, let me, what's his name? Looked, up, looked him up and this particular person that was speaking on the podcast that she thought was really impressive was a guy that used to be a pastor. He used to be an evangelist. And now he's been enlightened. So he knows a little bit more over and above what the Bible says, you know. And so I had to talk to her about that. I said, you know, let's just talk about this a little bit more, but really be careful what you put in, that type of thing. Because our minds, again, can justify things and we can fool ourselves. So that's why it's so important to go back to the Word of God and live our lives according to the Word. Don't, you know, try to look outside of the Word of God, but look into the Word of God. Place your love and affection on God. Help, ask Him to help you, and He will help us. He will help you. Don't try to figure things out sometimes. Like, we've got to use our minds, but again, but don't try to look at things that don't line up with God's Word and then meditate on them to the point where you justify them and you get into something that is not of God. Okay, you can open yourselves up to things you don't want to, so we don't want to. So God wants to love Him with all our minds as well, all our hearts, all our soul, all our mind, and then the last is all our strength. And that is the power, the might, the force, the ability for overcoming immediate resistance. Hmm. I like that. Sometimes we've got to say, God, give me strength to get through this resistance that I'm feeling today. All hell is breaking loose, God, against me. Give me the strength. Help me, God, 
to get through this, to place my affection on you and my love on you, everything on you. Give me strength. And then we do that. We do our best we, to strengthen all right, ourselves to sometimes force ourselves to follow what the word says. Sometimes we've got to force ourselves, don't we? Sometimes the, we, we don't want to follow the word of God. We got this flesh that we're warring inside of. The Bible says it's warring inside of us. The flesh wants to do one thing and the spirit is one thing. The Apostle Paul said the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. The Apostle Paul, who was one of the greatest evangelists, the greatest men of God in the Bible that ever lived, fought with his flesh. He says, I do things that I don't want to do and, and I don't do things that I should do. Man, this is tough. We're all going to experience that. But we've got to determine in our hearts that we're going to love God so much that we are going to force ourselves to do the right thing. We're going to force ourselves to live the Word of God out. How many know we've got to force ourselves, don't we, sometimes? We really do. We have to force ourselves sometimes. And sometimes it's hard, it's not easy. It could be friendships, maybe a friend that is going astray. It's not open to the gospel. We gotta have the strength to say, okay, I've gotta separate myself. I gotta love him, but I've gotta separate myself because I wanna find myself falling into the trap of where he's at. So sometimes we have to have the strength to step away and say, God, just give me that strength. Help me just to love you with all my heart and my soul. My mind, my strength, help me God to follow you, after you. So it represents our total being. And we love God. He says, love us, love him with our total being, our will, emotions, thoughts, the strength of our bodies. It covers actions. It covers everything. Everything we do should point to the love of God. That should be our filter, God's love. Am I doing this out of God's love? It means actively choosing a passionate pursuit of him. And that's my prayer, is that we would just get a passion for God, for his presence. Life just takes us away sometimes. We get so busy. We've got kids, we've got jobs, we've got ministry, we've got all these things pulling at us. And sometimes it's just so hard to stay focused on what's important and focused on him. But we need to actively pursue him. Seek ye first the kingdom and his righteousness, and he'll add things to us. We don't have to seek after things. We seek after him and those things will be added to us. That's the exciting part. That's what he promises to do for us. We talked about that last month in our prayer series. He won't give us what we want, he'll give us what we need. As we pray according to his will, he will give us to what we think. So contrary to public or to popular uh, thinking, love is not just a feeling. I feel love for God. It's a matter of choice. Right? We choose to love God. It's a choice. We can choose not to love God and just go our own way, or we can choose to love God and go His way and be all in for Him. Love Him with every part of our being. But we've got to choose and make that decision. When we focus on His way, we'll see God move, I believe. We look at guys who in the Bible, the person, people in the Bible who were passionate about God. David was passionate about God. God used him greatly. God was just amazingly evident in his life. He reached many, many lives. He's reaching us today. Even today. Paul was passionate about God. He was, he gave, he was all in. From Christian killer to Christian maker, right? I mean, he was out to kill all the Christians. He hated Christians. But God changed his heart and his life, and he pursued God with all his heart. He threw away those old things, and he started on the new pathway following God and loving God with all his heart, his mind, his soul, his strength. And God did great things through him. So God says to love me, seek me, pursue me. And God says, I will satisfy you. That relationship's not going to satisfy you with that person totally. That drug will not totally satisfy you. That alcohol won't totally satisfy you. Sleeping in every morning on Sunday won't satisfy you, right? We've got to get out and we've got to pursue God with everything that we have. 
In Jeremiah 33, it says, Call to me and I will answer you and tell you. And I will tell you great and mighty things which you do not know. God wants us to pursue him so he can tell us, he can talk to us, he can strengthen us, bring strength to us. And we place our love and our affection on him knowing that he will show us great and mighty things. He will help us to pursue him. He will help us to pursue things that are right. What's going to happen is God's going to do great things through us. I believe God wants to do things through us personally and as a church. We're not here for just happenstance today. We're here because God has brought us here. And he wants to know us better and he wants us to know him better. I mean, he knows every part of us, obviously. But he wants us to know him, to know him, to love him with everything we've got. And as we get to know him better and better and better, and we spend more and more time with him, the love for him will increase. It'll increase. It's always been my prayer in my personal life is, God, help me to love you until I'm overflowing with your love. Fill me with your love to overflowing. It's always been my prayer for many, many years. I just want to show forth God's love. I just want to be like him in that. Because people need to be loved just for themselves. Just because they're them. That's how God loves them. And we need to love them as well. We'll be talking about loving others later in the series. But we need to be living epistles, living letters that people can read us and they can see the love of Christ in us. And as we get to know God better, we get to know him better, that love will increase within us because we get to know him better. We're going to love him more. We're going to appreciate him more. So I want to encourage you in that. Then in closing, Romans chapter 12 Verses 1, it says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. King James, it says, which is, a, which is your reasonable service. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customers, uh, customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. So as we present our bodies, right, our souls, our spirits, everything, our whole being, our strength to him, he'll do great things. He'll do great things in our lives. We'll be a lot happier, a lot more fulfilled, and we'll be a great instrument of his love to people and to a world out there that needs the love of God, that agape love, that unconditional love. That's what God wants us to do, but we've got to do our best Again, to place our affections on him, to pursue him with everything we've got, to love him, to watch our, our thoughts, to fill ourselves with this word, the word of God, to worship him. Like it says here, to worship him. Truly, to worship him is to sacrifice yourself to him. Your body, which means our whole being sacrificed to him and loving him with everything we have got. In fact, really, it's only reasonable, isn't it? It's only reasonable that we love him with everything we got. He gave us everything we've got. Amen? Amen. He gave us everything he had in Jesus. And we as a reflection of Jesus, a reflection of him, we need to give him everything back that we've got. It's our reasonable sacrifice. And it's a sacrifice, isn't it? It's not easy because we want our way, don't we? But we know his way is always the best way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much, God, for your word. We thank you, Father, for the love that you have for us. And we just ask you today to help us love you back. Help each of us here, Lord, to love you with all our hearts our soul, our mind, our strength, God, everything within us, God, to love you, to place our affections on you, to invest in you, 
And as we do that, Lord, we ask you to help us, God, to be those living epistles, those living letters, a living love letter to those that need you, those that are searching for answers, those that feel just rejected and just worthless. Help us as your people, God, to love them like you love us. Help us, God, to truly overflow with your love. Fill us so much with your love that it will overflow in this house. That New Hope Bible Church will be a, known as a church that is full of real people, full of real hope, as they see us reach out to them in love, unconditional love, agape love, a love that looks past their appearance, their dress, whatever it would be, Lord. We'd look past those things, even their personalities. They don't line up with what we think they should be. We love them anyways, God. We accept them here at New Hope, Lord, where you can get a hold of their hearts, Lord. And they can be where we desire to be, loving you with all our hearts, our souls, our mind, and our strength. If you're here today, you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. I like to say it's easy as ABC. First of all, we just admit that we've sinned against God. We've done things that weren't loving towards God. We know that they were against the word of God, but we know that we shouldn't be doing those things. We admit that, and then we just believe that Jesus Christ came to die on that cross for us. The Bible says that for God so loved the world, he gave his only son, one and only son, that whoever believes in him won't perish, will have everlasting life. Look. And then we just commit our way to him. The Bible says we commit our ways to him as we live the word of God out and we are led by his spirit. He'll show us the path. He'll guide our paths. So if you're here today and haven't accepted Christ, I'd love to give you that opportunity. I'll be here after service if I can just talk to you about that. But it's easy as you can do it here. Accept Christ at home, wherever it be. Admit, believe, and just commit your life to him. And that love for God will increase in your life as you get to know him more. Father, I speak blessings over your people today, God. I just pray that you would just again reveal yourself to each and every one in a mighty and a dynamic way, God. That they will know how much you love them, Father. And that they will be reflectors of love back to you and also to the world, to those that need you. We thank you for this time we've had here together, God. I just, again, speak blessings over your people. I thank you, Father, for their desire to know you better, to know you more. I thank you, Father, that they took time out to come this morning just to be with us, and I just speak blessings over them as well for that. I just thank you so much, God, for what you're doing, Lord, at New Hope. I just pray you'll continue to move by your spirit, God, that you will continue to help us to love you more, to reflect you more, God than ever before. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, thank you for coming today. If you need prayer, I'll be up here. I'll be happy to pray for you. Again, we have prayer at uh, 7 o'clock on Thursday. We'd love to have you here. We meet here. If you can come at 7.30, whatever, 7.45, whatever time you're here to pray with us, that would be wonderful. Have a great week. God bless you.